Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Penny now, Penny Armstrong, and this is Alan. They are running um, Transition Turry Field, um, which is a CSA in Shetland Islands. Penny also has a background in uh, project management and in community organisation, um, so she's very well qualified <laughs> for this kind of uh, talk. <laughs> so um, over to you, Penny. So just a wee bit of background then as to where we are. <clears throat> Shetland's at 60 degrees north, so it's quite far north. And we are, well, we always say that we're on the very edge of being able to grow things up here. If we get a bad summer, um, it doesn't really work very well for us, does it? So you can see where we're here, my big pink pointer here. We're um, about as far west as you can get in, in Shetland. So we're, we're here on a sticky out bit, which is surrounded by sea. So this is just a, a quick picture of, of where we are. And <clears throat> you can't really see very well from that picture, but we're, we're sort of down in a dip. So we're sheltered, relatively sheltered in, in uh, Shetland terms. And as you can see there, we've got quite a few polytunnels. So we make use of these polytunnels to grow year round. This is a bit of a closer photograph and you can see there how close, <clears throat> how close the sea is. And being in Shetland, we're obviously a, an, an island um, local authority. So we have a maritime climate and that really impacts on, on what we grow and when we grow things. It's quite high humidity. We don't really get frosts, very few frosts um, throughout the year, which is quite difficult, different to, to mainland um, Scotland, I would imagine. So us as an organisation, we're a community interest company and we set up in 2011. We were doing veg boxes from 2011, but we didn't become a CSA or we didn't take on a CSA model until 2016. That's been working quite well since we started that. We've got about three acres of growing land. It's all on less favoured areas, so our soil is incredibly poor. If we weren't working it, or if it hadn't been given over to sheep before we arrived, it would be heather, it would be peaty, and it would be very acidic um, and just covered in, in heather plants. So it's, it's what's considered le less favorable area land. 10% of our growing area is under cover. And we try and grow as much as we can outside, but being this far north, we're quite limited in terms of the range of crops we can grow if we don't use undercover growing spaces. We've got about 30 veg boxes, which makes up about 50% of the produce we grow and the sales that we make. And the rest of it, another 50% goes to shops like local rural shops and the local whole food shop in the, the main town. We operate um, between March and Christmas. So third week in March is usually when the first veg box goes out and we operate fortnightly between the third week in March and the first week in July. Then we offer weekly veg boxes between the first week in July and the third week in October. And then we go back to fortnightly again up to Christmas. And the reason we do that is to do with the amount of daylight we have and the speed at which things grow. So we go, we go weekly um, in July because things are actually coming that, that fast. We've got two full-time staff, which is ourselves. Um, we're not necessarily paid staff, but we do work more than full-time hours. And we have our 50 ad hoc volunteers. 30 of those are our veg box household. And on top of that, we have at least another 20 volunteers who aren't um, or don't get the produce. We're looking at actually changing that model now um, uh, because not all of the households that get the veg boxes actually bother to turn up, even though we have, um, it's, it's part of their contract to do that. But anyway, that's by the by. We're no dig, we operate on a no dig basis and we've been doing that for about sort of six or seven years, something like that. And we are we adhere to organic principles. <clears throat> now, I wanted to show you this because this is something for us that actually really informed our growing through the season. It's about understanding um, how our season works. And it's, it's quite a complicated site, so I apologize for that up front. But what it's showing is a comparison between Shetland and London. So a lot of um, information on growing vegetables is based on the south of England. Um, we are in a completely different situation. <clears throat> so the important things to notice here, if you can actually see it, um, are is this pale green one, 
which is our daylight hours. And you can see that we go from less than six up to nearly 19 in the middle of the summer. <clears throat> Whereas here, you've got a lot less. I think it's 8.4 down there and 16.5 here. So our changes in daylight are quite, quite dramatic. And then obviously our temperature, this is, this is actually the two graphs are aligned so that um, they, they equate to each other, you can compare them. And the pink line here is your average temperature and you can see how much lower it is than the south of England here. So our temperatures are cooler. Having said that in the winter, it doesn't necessarily drop very, very low. It doesn't go down to freezing. Our minimum temperatures aren't quite as low as this here. And then the other significant one is this yellow one here, which is our sunny days, the amount of sun hours we actually have. And you can see the difference between the two lines there. Now, this is really quite steady throughout the summer and ours peaks in May and then drops off quite considerably here. Now, this obviously affects the winter growing, how much sunlight, um, sunshine we actually get. And the other thing that I always point out with this um, <clears throat> uh, for a bit of amusement is this orange line here is the wind. We don't have it on this graph. That's because it's off the scale most of the time. It's really, really windy here being a maritime climate. We'll come back to this in a bit more detail <clears throat> a bit later. <clears throat> so for us, being this far north, even though we have a lot of hours of daylight in the middle of the year, the intensity of our sun is a lot less and the angle between the difference uh, of, of sunshine as it hits the earth is 15 degrees less in Shetland than it is in London. So that intensity, we just don't have the intensity of that, that sunlight. This, of course, is amplified in the winter because this is what happens um, as the seasons change. The angle of the sun hitting the earth changes and gets less. So in the winter, it is even less for us. The power of the sun that we have is markedly, markedly reduced compared to the south of England. So things that we think are important about um, growing through the winter or supplying veg boxes through the winter, things that are really important that we think um, you have to consider is your planning. It has to be planned. I don't think you can ever be, you can't decide I want to grow through the winter and then and, and, and not have it planned. It doesn't work like that. Certainly it doesn't for us anyway. Choosing varieties and cultivars, it's important to know which crops will work for you, for where you are. Um, and within the varieties, um, which cultivars are actually going to be more successful than others. You need to know when to um, sow. It's really important to get things sown at the right time and in the ground at the right time. You need to consider whether you need protection or not, or if you're going to use additional heat and light. Now we don't use additional heat and light in the autumn end of the season. We do use it early on because it allows us to get things started earlier um, and to have things ready to go in the ground as soon as our soil is warm enough and we have enough daylight. So it's really important for us to have things started so we can get things going and make use of the very short season that we have. The other thing is storage. Um, we do keep um, in storage things like carrots, beetroot, celeriac, we leave parsnips in the ground. Um, but we, we do that, and it, it's on a lot smaller scale than some places might, might use, but we, we do use storage. And again, I'll speak about that later. The other thing that is important, as far as I'm concerned, is about customer expectations. Because we, uh, our veg box is seasonal, we expect people to understand that what they're going to get through the winter months is going to be a lot less um, than they would obviously through the, through the summer. And as I said before, we operate between the middle of March and Christmas. We used to do veg boxes all year round. A lot of it was um, root veg they were getting between um, January and, and March. And then one year, I think we decided we wanted to go on holiday. And so we didn't do it. And then we realized what a joy it was to actually have that break, that 10 week break, not actually having to harvest or, or, or put out veg boxes. So we, we've continued with that. It suits us. It suits us best. OK, so planning. Um, basically, when you're doing your seed orders, you need to know what you're buying, uh, what, you, what you need for the whole um, 12 months of your of your growing. You need to have your plot organized. And you need to understand when you need to sow things. Um, and it's just a continuous sowing um, 
process of when, uh, when things need to go in to be ready at a certain time. You need to know what you want to grow and what you can grow and what space is needed. And the reason you need to know that is because you need to know um, what's going to follow what, where it's going to be, because you need that space. It depends on how much space you've got. Most of us don't have an endless amount of space, so you need to utilise that space in a way um, that means you've got crops going in and coming out at the appropriate times. So uh, what, what's going to follow what? Um, so when your winter, when, when are your summer crops going to go out and your winter crops go in and vice versa? When are those winter crops coming out and your summer crops um, going in? So in terms of uh, timing and choosing your varieties and cultivars, you really need to think about how much time a crop needs to get to that edible stage from sowing um, and what you need to supply it with to produce the plant that you want to put for sale or to, or to eat, whether you can supply those conditions. I'm going to talk about this more in just to in just give you some examples in just a second. Um, <clears throat> and for us, it's definitely about minimum light levels required for the for the plants as a real impact and if you need any seasonal stimulants so for example in the polytunnels over um, the winter we actually use a summer uh, purple sprouting broccoli called santi it's an f1 but we put that in over the winter because it will grow and it will produce heads whereas if we use the um, usual purple sprout and broccoli, the open pollinators uh, purple sprout and broccoli, and have that under cover through the winter, we find that, that it only produces about 30%, 30% of the plants actually produce, produce heads. So it's waste of space, waste of um, nutrients being taken out of the soil. And it makes sense for us to use the summer stuff, which survives the winter fine where we are. So in terms of choosing cultivars and um, you know, the varieties that you can, that can, you can use, um, so things like tomatoes, they need a, a higher temperature, they need sun to produce their, their fruit, um, and they need, they need a certain soil temperature, certain, certain air temperature as well. So there's no way we would even think about germinating um, tomatoes at the end of the year to try and have them, not without additional heat and light anyway. And we just don't think that's, that's necessary. Potatoes less so, they're a bit more tolerant of less daylight, le lower temperatures. So um, we do find people up here putting potatoes in, in in August, something like that, because they want them for, for Christmas. It's not something that we do. They are more tolerant of that win those winter conditions, undercover anyway. Um, cabbages, your brassicas, they tend to be far more tolerant. We have a lot of success with brassicas up here. They cope with the low light levels, they cope with the low temperatures, they cope with the humidity. Um, so they actually work well in terms of winter, winter growing. And then, of course, something like salad and leafy crops. So the, um, you know, the Chinese spicy stir fry leaves, the pak choys, things like that, they will really grow not too badly in low levels of, of light and low temperatures if you get them in at the right time. So it's about knowing what your plants need um, as to whether they'll work or not. So this is that graph that I was um, showing earlier in a little bit more detail. So what we've got here again is the green line here is our sunny days, the amount of sun hours that we actually get. So you can see here, it's like May, it's peaking here, dropping off quite, quite rapidly. And then we've got the soil temperature is the yellow and the daylight hours is the orangey one here. So if we're thinking about sowing seeds for winter crops, I oh know, go back a step. This here in the middle of October is when our um, growth really markedly drops off. So that's really important for us to know. Here, in this latter end of November, and we've just hit this point at the moment, is where the growth really stops. Our daylight hours are not long enough to actually get any um, purposeful growth in a plant of any, of any type. So for instance, our salad leaves, we've actually stopped harvesting the salad leaves and what we have left now will sit until our Christmas veg box. Um, so if we want to sow, 
if we sow into modules in the middle of August, we will be able to crop from September until Christmas. And here, so this is the latest direct sowing. So the first lot is grown in modules and planted out in September. If we sow in the first week of October, then we can have um, plants sitting at the two leaf stage and they will overwinter at the two leaf stage and then they will kick off in the spring. So if we want to have um, to harvest things like celery, for example, then we'll make sure that they are sown within the first week of July. We actually do a couple of sowings of celery, one um, that will be ready by Christmas and then another one that we sow slightly later, which will then be ready um, in March the following year. And then this here is the last planting to get plants established. So things like celery and pak choy, so the bigger, the bigger plants rather than just the leafy things. Um, <clears throat> this is the last date for us that they need to be in the ground to allow them to get their roots down um, and be established enough to cope in the winter. And if we have plants under cover in the polytunnel established by then, even if we're not harvesting them, but once we get here to the middle of February, it's February the 14th, we will say Valentine's Day. And you can see with the daylight hours and soil temperature is all just taken off at that point. And then by the time we get to the second week in March, they're desperate to be harvested. So <clears throat> by getting things in the ground here, not only does it allow us to harvest right up until Christmas, but also to hit the ground running here when we're um, starting off with the veg boxes again. And that gives us crops right up until May, until we take them out of the polytunnel and put the summer crops in. This is just a, a quick example. So this is something here, well, it's, it's spinach and, and chard that was sown in modules on the 16th of August. And this is November now, and this is obviously where we would be cropping from this. These were direct sown. This is a few years ago now, we do it a bit differently now. Um, this was direct sown in the polytunnel on the 30th of August. So on the same date, you can see the different size of the plants. So it's just two weeks difference in terms of the sowing uh, makes a huge difference in how much the plant can progress. And it's all to do with the daylight and the, and the temperature. Now, what we do now is we actually sow as part of our eight crop polyron, polytunnel rotation around about the third week in July. And this is um, this was taken last week, and it's again it's chard and spinach, perpetual spinach rather than true spinach. But we've already had um, six harvests of this. If we sow that on the twenty sixth of July, we can crop it starting September. That will continue until Christmas, and we will be able to crop um, until May, till the following May, and then we we take that out. And I think what follows that? Can't remember what follows that. Oh, um... <laughs> We'll come on to that in a minute. Yes, we'll come on to that now. So if you are continuously using your undercover space um, to provide crops through the winter, then you obviously need to think about what you're putting in in terms of your rotation and how you're going to feed that crop. So we've got, as I mentioned, an eight crop rotation um, over a five-year period here. Now we have eight polytunnels, which allows us to have like three years at the end of this rotation for various different bits of salad. So it doesn't immediately don't go back to having brassicas in again um, too soon after that. Uh, have, you, have you been to how many crops? Jim? There's a little bit more than eight. It's nine. I know, shut up. <laughs> don't listen to him. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so how we feed um, as we're doing this, this rotation. So what we've got here is we've got the cucurbits. And this is what we call our, our first uh, first crop, and it's the only time that we dig on the whole on the whole croft. We actually take off the top um, ten centimeters and we put manure and seaweed, and then we put the, the the soil back over the top. The reason we do that is to basically um, to keep it moist and allow the microbes to start working on it and break it break it down. So these go straight into that, um, and then the, when they come out in September, we then put brassicas in to, to try and get rid of any excess nitrogen, because what's following that is the, the, the salinicae, the tomato, um, and the chilies and the peppers and things, and we don't want them to have too much nitrogen. We do put a dose of seaweed on there, so they make sure they've got the micronutrients, um, and then as you can see, if you if you look through, through that, the, the things we do, we... Um, 
we don't necessarily feed, but it's incorporated into that whole rotation. Where it says hens here, just, just for information, is we put hens in the polytunnel for at least a week. Um, we do tend in Shetland to get a real problem with um, earwigs. We call them forky tails. And the hens keep down, they don't get them completely, but they, they keep down them enough that they don't, they don't, devastate, the, don't devastate the plant. And then the other thing you notice is that we use <clears throat> peat and wood ash, um, and that raises the pH and, and keeps down on, um, What's it called? Okay. Club root. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing is obviously um, things that you can do. <clears throat> the undercover protection greenhouse polytunnel. You could have a heated one, but we just think that's excessive. And then these days of wanting to reduce carbon emissions, etc., it's unnecessary. Um, caterpillar or mini tunnels. Caterpillar tunnels are becoming quite popular. They're no use to us whatsoever up here because we just cannot pin things down enough um, to use something like that. We do use mini tunnels, which allows us to extend the season either in the beginning or at the end of the season if we're planting salad or something like that in raised beds. Uh, and then we can remove the mini tunnels later on and store them in the worst of the weather. Coal frames, same sort of, same sort of idea. Windbreaks are really important to us because of the gales that we get. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Floating crop covers, things like EnviroMesh um, and, and fleeces. We don't use fleeces outside because it doesn't work up here. Raised beds um, are useful for warming the soil earlier in the season, but they can also be, if you're using them over winter, they can also be very vulnerable to uh, cold if you're in a frosty area. But they certainly have their uses, particularly for poor, poor land. And then mulches using things like straw or compost or even cardboard or carpet can actually keep the heat in the soil at the end of the season. Um, not so good if your ground is covered in the early uh, part of the season and the sun can't actually hit the soil if the, if the straw or um, cardboard, for instance, are keeping the sun off the soil, it, it actually doesn't allow it to warm up as quickly but it all very useful. Hotbeds, something that we spoke about, never actually got around to trying, but a lot of people swear by, by hotbeds. Okay, so this, um, we use a lot of tires, which is maybe contentious for some folk, but uh, on Shetland, they cost a lot to actually ship to our south um, to get rid of, and they are invaluable for us for holding down all sorts of things, propping open polytunnel doors, and in this case, building three tire high windbreaks for the, for the leaks. Couldn't do without them, could we? <laughs> uh, EnviroMesh, you all know about EnviroMesh. We tend not to cover our crops in EnviroMesh over the winter. We start, um, we put them on, allow the plants to establish, and then we take them off, partly to allow pest predators in, and um, partly to stop the chaffing and the What's it mold. called? The mould, yes, because the closed environment, it, it raises the humidity, which is not good for the plants. But they can be useful. They can be useful. This is us using fleece in the polytunnels. If the temperature drops below three degrees, we will um, throw some fleece over it, take it off in the daytime, just to make sure that we actually get that air movement around the plants. So this is us putting um, storage, and I'm sure Dom will have a completely different approach to storage because his will be on a lot larger scale. But this is um, what we do, is we lift the carrots and we store them in sand in fish boxes. Now these fish boxes can stack and the way they fit together is they allow no mice in, which is really, really important, particularly if they're covered securely at the top. Um, so we would store, as I say, carrot, beetroot and celeriac like that. Nothing else we store like that, is there? No. So we've got you know, teams of volunteers to help us get us. And we know, that the um, fish boxes hold about 25 kilos of carrots. So we've got an idea of how much we need to use each time we um, do a veg box run. So we do find that we have botrytis. Um, that's to do with our low light levels and our high humidity that we have here. Um, and ventilation is the answer. We practically, I can't say eradicated it, but we keep on top of it by keeping the doors open. Even in force 10 gales, we keep the doors open. It's only when it goes above that <laughs> and we worry about the structure of the, the undercover spaces. Um, 
Coal damage, then you've seen that already. We put fleece over it, uh, crop covers. Now, I think if you're in very frosty places or your temperature drops very, very low, then um, plants will suffer. Quite often they do recover as long as it's not too long, too prolonged or too severe the, the drop. And the pests, aphids and mice, we do find that, well, we used to find that we got aphids um, in the, the start of the year, once the plants were feeling tired and vulnerable. Um, but basically, the, as we've increased our soil health and increased our biodiversity, and we always keep um, what's called fever few in the polytunnels as well, and that flowers almost year round, which allows the, um, what are they called? Overflies. Thank you. <laughs> I knew I needed them here. Overflies and lace wings and things like that, they're, they're larva. To actually start and keep going um, early well, it, on in the year. Feeds the adults. Yeah, yeah it feeds the, the adults out, yeah, in the spring. Yeah, they're there. So the more we work with that, that, that organic practice and um, you know increasing the biodiversity, the, the better it is to come. But I should say, oh, well, no, this is a picture of um, botrytis damaged spring onions that have overwintered. Um, but they will just perk up once we get to the 14th of February. The UV levels are high enough that just it just wipes it, it just stops plants recover and they're ready to go. So you can be looking at plants that you think aren't going to survive and they they just perk up no end. Okay, and this is just a picture of crops um, that are overwintered. This was, I think, March last year. I think they, they think these lettuces might have been sown in modules and planted out early, but the rest is actually over overwintered. So herbs like coriander, spicy salad, this is spicy stir fry leaves, and the um, land press. This is a, a lot of crops that were, this is mostly kale and spicy stir fry stuff here. Um, I think there's celery at the end there. But this was sown in the first week of October, and this will be the first week of March. Over with it, and so it's not far off being cropped. This is celery and pak choy that was grown through the winter, so it's probably sown middle of July and harvested, I think, end of March, beginning of April. And now this is a video. So this is my last slide. So I'm going to shut up now and hand over to Don. But um, <clears throat> this is a very quick video. It's only about a minute long. That shows us. Um, stripping out the polytunnel, sowing things, getting things in for the winter, and then us going through to harvest the following year. So it goes from, this is the middle of September, um, and then I'll try and time the I'm speaking of it yet. So this is us taking the stuff out middle of September, planting in the module sown brassicas, so it would be cabbages and purple sprout and broccoli. The volunteers clearing this out, this is the 29th of September. We've got time. Volunteers are good for this sort of thing. <laughs> so this is a week, well, about five days later, this is us sowing the kale, direct sowing the kale into the ground there. So that's the first week in October. This is, uh, yeah, it's November. I'm getting to the end of November there. This is December. January, we've got the fleece out. <laughs> okay, so we're end of January, February. And this is March, we're just starting to harvest now. It's March, you can see. Purple sprite and broccoli has already been cropped once. There, just cropping it again. And we're heading towards May, looking at those overwintering cabbages. And that's it going to seed. And that's us, then we would take that out and then get it ready for the hens going in. And okay, there we go. So that's me, I will shut up now. So at the moment, I'm growing in a half acre wall garden um, with five polytunnels in the Barmy um, Y Valley in South Herefordshire. We're just across the river from Gloucestershire and pretty near the Welsh border with Monmouthshire. So we're right on the edge of three different counties there. Um, I've only been here two years and uh, we're still we're still finding our way, really. Um, so um, most of what I'm going to refer to um, today is more about some other places that I've worked. Um, originally, my partner and I did our two-year apprenticeship through the Biodynamic Association at a small care farm in, uh, well, near Darlington, on the very edge of North Yorkshire and County Durham. Um, 
And uh, that has quite a lot of relevance to talking about growing and storing vegetables because we, we were trained by an old school German, half German, half Dutch grower who stored everything because he was used to winters going down to minus 20 routinely. So we learned a lot of useful stuff there um, about storage. And um, after traveling around a bit, we then um, worked at the Pillars of Hercules in Fife for two years. So this is a nice picture of the cafe and farm shop at the Pillars. Um, at Pillars of Hercules, we grew around about um, something along the lines of 10-ish acres of field vegetables. And we had, at that point, we had 15 polytunnels there as well. Um, we didn't store hardly anything at Pillars, but we did grow throughout the winter, which I hadn't ever done anywhere else I've been before. So it's a fantastic learning opportunity. Um, and despite being at, a, a, well, certainly compared to where I'm now, a much more northerly latitude, um, we generally kept harvest going virtually right the way through winter, which was a, a very interesting to experience. And um, when I left the Pillars in... Uh, end of 2015, I I got a job at Canal Side CSA in Leamington Spa in Warwickshire. So that's in the English Midlands, um, not too far from Birmingham and Coventry. And I grew there for five years on about 10 acres of field veg and seven tunnels. Um, much of what I'm going to share today um, comes from how we did it at Canal Side, because we did uh, up to sort of about 180 shares a week. Um, every week throughout the year with no winter break and only using our own veg. We didn't buy in anything at all, um, which looking back is kind of ridiculous, but we somehow got away with it. I remember those tricky days in February, scratching around, trying to find something to put in the share because you need at least seven or eight items for 180 people every week. Somehow we always got away with it. Um, but um, there is quite an important point here that we were growing for a CSA that was quite rough and ready. And our membership, uh, similar to what Penny was saying, our membership was had signed up to that. And they had a good tolerance of, um, you know, veg that you would struggle to sell in a lot of, say, farm shops or something where people have higher standards. Um, so consequently, the, some of the winter storage we got away with, you might, doesn't, that just wouldn't work where I am now, for example, um, where... Uh, our outlets in Y Organic, where I currently work, are more uh, people are a bit fussier, let's put it that way. So, um, so you've got to bear that in mind with um, uh, what I'm going to share. Um, so, I was going to work through um, vegetables, sort of group by group, and share how we did it at Canal Side, um, starting off with roots. So, um, there is a picture of our carrots, which we field stored all winter. Um, and um, from a sort of main crop carrot growth in about uh, November time, we would roll big bell straw over the top. Um, you know, this is a practice done even in like big large scale growing with massive machinery and everything. And we did it more of a kind of rustic way. And um, we would uh, pick every, every three-ish weeks, we'd pick enough carrots to last us that period of time. Um, we generally found after about four weeks, the carrots quality was really starting to deteriorate. And um, we were able to do it this way for a better quality product. Um, the biggest issue was uh, mice and voles loving it under the um, straw, uh, eating the carrot tops um, because we'd given them both a food source and a warm, relatively safe habitat. Um, but again, we just we grayed out uh, the worst damaged ones and often we'd get away with put ones with just a bit of nibbling. We could get away with putting them in the share and that generally worked quite well. Um, we really had to think of drainage. The soil well wasn't particularly well drained when I started at Canal Side and we did a lot of work trying to free that up through subsoiling and good green manure practices. Um, and uh, one year I do remember losing by February, losing a lot of the crop after very heavy rain followed by freezing conditions, which just turned the carrots to mush. But um, after that experience, we found we got our carrots going right the way through till the end of April um, with this method, which worked an absolute treat. Um, and uh, that when we were back at Clairvo, our, um, uh, that's uh, the place where I trained in Dullington. My trainer um, didn't, couldn't cope with leaving carrots in the field all winter, so we harvested the entire crop and stored them in clamps over winter, but we really, um, we didn't 
huge straw there uh, and the quality really deteriorated they would you know they'd be fine in a famine but you'd struggle to sell them i think um so that was a learning experience for us and um this fine young man uh was uh, assistant grower when i was at canal side and now he's uh, one of the lead growers i think um posing with a beetroot uh, beetroot, we, uh, whilst here in South Herefordshire, I feel that we could leave beetroots in the field all year, um, all winter long. Um, but at Canal Side, we clamped them um, mainly just because we found the vermin damage was so bad from beetroots in the field. Um, and it was a really, it was a really nice community day. And what we do, we built inside our barn, which was insulated with straw bales, which you can hopefully see at the back there. Um, we built uh, clamps where we'd layer in a few layers deep of beetroot and then sprinkle sand over the top, then put another layer of beetroot on. And we'd store many tons in that way um, and just scrape them out of the clamp when we needed them. The, the, um, we would had a, a lot of old duvets, which in very, very cold snaps, um, we would drape over the top just to keep them insulated against uh, too much freezing. And... Um, it worked very nicely um, to the extent that we got a lot of complaints for giving people too much beetroot because it just stores so much. Um, there's a nice picture there of Stephen again. You can see we grew several different varieties. So we've got a red beetroot on one side and golden on the other. That really helps um, alleviate sort of beetroot sickness with people where we could alternate giving them uh, red beetroot, then two weeks later, give them the golden, two weeks later, give them the Chioggia. And uh, that way they, they sort of didn't feel like they were getting the same vegetable every single time. So uh, we built those straw bales all, all the way around the edge and you can see the sand there. And then we just scraped the beetroot out. And that um, has no relevance to anything except that it's a nice picture of uh, Cylindra beetroot from Darlington. Um, and here we have a similar thing with celeriac, which in, in a canal side in the sort of around about the first to third week of November, we would bring all the um, celeriac in and store them in the same way, um, slicing the tops off and then layering them with sand. And they would tend to stay good till about the end of March, slightly less long than beetroots, but still seals right the way through the winter. And a similar picture. Potatoes, obviously a bit of a powerhouse for the CSA where we had uh, potatoes in the share almost every single week of the entire year. There's often a few weeks in May when we wouldn't have them before the tunnel new potatoes would kick in. Um, so with potatoes, we have a big community day, one of the biggest days of the year with the CSA, where we lift them all with our little single row lifter and um, huge volunteer groups descend on the place and pick the potatoes up and put them all into sacks. Uh, you can see them there on a particularly warm potato harvest day. Um, the best yield we ever got, I think was around 12 tons um picked up in this way and then you can see those three ply potato sacks that we use we would stack them up in our barn um in uh, well they were in uh those big uh potato crates but in the sacks um we had previously had them loose but we found there were way too many problems with that and having them in the sacks worked much better um if a rat got into the store we found they they couldn't work their way through the whole lot so easily strangely and uh, pockets of rot didn't spread so bad. And it was very convenient for us to just hoik a sack out of the crates. Um, so those those potatoes would be, so the, the big stack of those potato sacks would be surrounded by straw bales and um, some duvets draped over the top. And in that way, um, we usually ran out about the first week of May, but they were fairly shriveled there. And But with that sort of community buy-in, and the fact the community, the membership of Canal Side had picked the potatoes, they, well, they'd helped plant them too helped um, work through them. They had, they were quite, people were more than happy to eat those tatties when they were a bit shrinkled up. Um, and at Clairvo, um, we didn't have a barn to put them in. This is in Darlington. Um, so we made a clamp like this, uh, straw bells around the edge, and then we draped layers of straw over the top and then um, for insulation. And then something like sort of old carpet, something along those lines, that uh, was breathable, but most of the moisture would run off towards the edge. So we built it in a sort of pyramid shape at the top. Um, and uh, there we ran out of potatoes sort of between January and February. So I never found out how, how they would do going right the way through the winter. Um, 
before I move on to onions, um, let's enjoy that picture of Nanda with the potatoes a bit longer. Um, some other root vegetables from Canal Side that saw us through our winter. Parsnips we field stored always right the way through till May. Um, they didn't need covering with anything. We just dug them as we needed and uh, they were absolutely fine. Swede, um, we also field stored swede. At Clerva, I do remember clamping swede in much the same manner as that potato clamp you can see in front of you. And they did store very well. Um, the only downside of the swede is that they tended to bolt around about March time. And I think if we'd have, say brought them in for clamping a bit earlier, we might have preserved them longer than if they'd been sat in the field getting warm again. Um, Jerusalem artichokes we kept in the field. Um, no one likes them anyway, so it doesn't really matter very much. Um, but when we did put them in the share, maybe twice, once or twice over the winter, we just go and dig them up as we needed. And the other, my absolute favourite that also people struggle with, is black Spanish radish, which is just seems absolutely bomb-proof from any kind of winter conditions. So we grew a fair bit of black Spanish radish and set out on a mission to try and um, educate people on using it. Um, but it, certainly in famine conditions, you'd be overjoyed to have one. Um, but they sat in the field till April kind of time and really, really useful winter veg. And just having those, the bigger variety of root vegetables stop the members complaining too much. They're getting roots week in, week out because you could work through them on a kind of rotor. Um, so moving on to some alliums. Um, onions were the easiest thing we found to store. Um, where we, we'd um, lift our, when the, um, as the saying goes, when the flags are down, when the tops of the onions start to keel over, we, uh, after a certain percentage of the flags are down, I can't remember now, about 50% maybe, we go through and pull them up and lie them on the um, uh, mypex that we, uh, the black plastic sheet that we grew them through and left them there for a month to cure, which generally, even in quite wet, wet Augusts, um, it was remarkable how well they cured. Um, it felt like they'd been sat in water for a month, but somehow they still stored very, very well. We put them in these nets and put them on racking and we'd store, store and we put them in the barn um, and we stored many tons that way. And for years and years, um, we were convinced that they wouldn't survive cold weather. So we were constantly putting, du draping duvets over the entire construction and pulling them off, draping duvets over when it got cold and we were worried about frost damage. And then someone visiting one day said, you don't have to do that, they'll be absolutely fine. And we found that they just sat in the barn. The barn was certainly not frost proof. It wasn't insulated at all in that bit. And there were no issues at all there. Um, leeks was a rather winter store. Um, unlike some of the root veg people, it felt like people couldn't get enough leeks. And we put them in fortnightly throughout the share from uh, Christmas till May. I tended to sit on the leeks till Christmas um, much to the frustration of league fans because we had so much more variety, so much diversity of other things at that stage. Um, so we grew uh, mainly blue green winter, uh, various sort of named sub varieties of blue green winter and um, bandit, bandit absolutely incredible for standing till May without much problem. And there's a picture here of a volunteer group um, knocking back the weeds a little bit around the, uh, around the onion, around the leeks. Um, and some this that year we had a phenomenally wet November. It was absolutely terrible, absolutely soaking. There's standing water in the leak patch down at the bottom where the field leveled out, and they still somehow got through it and uh, stood there till May quite happily enough. Um, and just to give Pillars of Hercules its recognition, there's a nice field of leaks probably in about. Uh, probably June time or something like that, maybe July actually, um, at the pillars. Um, I've also found, incidentally, here at Y Organic, I found leeks to be the vegetable we cannot grow enough of. We thought we grew quite a big patch of them this year and they sold instantly, just straight away. So I've got dreams of starting having a field here because we're not doing any field cropping here in the Y Valley yet. But when we do, leeks is going to be one of the crops we grow a lot of because we have huge deer problems here too. And I think leeks are relatively deer proof. Um, so moving on to some um, uh, leafy vegetables. Um, this was how we stored cabbage in Darlington, um, which was great. And so sort of getting on towards maybe the beginning of no, uh, December or so, um, we would harvest our cabbage and uh, grow very tight uh, headed uh, ball head varieties. Um, and we stack them up in these big crates and then um, 
drape a layer of um, straw over the top. And it was remarkable how well they kept that way for months and months, especially if they were really tight heads. Um, and uh, we just uh, peel away a few outer leaves. They look fairly rank if you pull them out of that store in about March and have a thick layer of fuzzy gray mold over the top. Um, but peel a few leaves back and you ended up with a pristine cabbage um, beneath. I haven't done that since then. That was 12 years ago, but I've never felt the necessity uh, to store cabbages in that way. We do occasionally, if I needed to, I might bring in a whole load of um, bull head cabbage in winter and just put them in um, potato sacks and just leave them in the barn. And uh, again, it was similar, but we just do that for a few weeks, um, maybe a month, perhaps. Um, at Canal Side, we tended to grow varieties of cabbage that stood in the field um, without getting too upset. Uh, Tundra F1 was our favourite. That could stand right through till March um, without blinking, really. And that was a really useful vegetable to have at that time of year. One year when I couldn't get hold of Tundra, there was another variety we tried, another F1, which also did well. But a lot of open pollinated um, varieties, we left them out in the field far longer than the seed catalogue said or anything like that. And we found they would still write even not varieties that weren't supposed to be particularly hardy would still stand till January or something like that. So we found we could really push that. And then obviously you've got January King and some um, decent uh, Savoy varieties that do well over the winter. Um, I Ah, uh, there's a nice Savoy cabbage um, and a beautiful specimen there. That's from Darlington, that one. Um, and there's our, uh, when you store cabbages in the way I showed, we do very little dressing. You can see the, the outer leaves on those um, red cabbage, they stay on because you want those ones to go moldy rather than the good ones on the inside. Um, before we dash onto squash, um, the, uh, the other real um, fantastic vegetable from Canal Sides, um, was uh, cauliflower over winter, which um, my previous grower, uh, the previous grower at Canal Side before me, Will Johnson, was a real um, cauliflower enthusiast, and he developed a really good cropping plan that aimed to have cauliflowers in steadily right through from December through till May kind of the time. Um, the downside of this is that it relies on a lot of non-organic F1 varieties. Um, uh, there are some um, more traditional open pollinated and organic seeds as well, but if you want a real consistent um, the best quality, then we found we had to, we did have to bring in some of those whilst using the well available organic ones, um, such as medallion. And uh, I think Alsmere isn't available organic, but is open pollinated. That was a good one for April, I think, if my memory serves right. Um, so we grew a lot of cauliflower because it was something we could give the members in winter that wasn't a black Spanish radish uh, or a leek. So it kept the share a lot more interesting. And um, when th they can really, really get going in April, May time, we had some really, really good crops. So that's the, you know, the peak of our hungry gap. Um, so it's a fantastic time to have that. Um, there's a lot more leaves that we grow in the tunnels, especially over winter. Um, I don't want to go into this too much. Um, Penny covered quite a lot of this. But um, here at Y Organic, we've got um, Pak Choy, Chard, Spinach, Spring Greens and Red Russian Kale in the winter that we'll keep on picking all the way through. I'm discovering being here in the balmy south that um, stuff doesn't stop growing hardly at all, barely even for a week in January based on my first two years here. Um, which is a whole new whole new thing really to get used to and it's almost a bit too much I would prefer it if it did stop growing so we could have more of a break perhaps um, but that's another story and finally I'll talk a little bit about um, fruiting vegetables squash probably don't need too much introduction it was another one at canal side that helped us get through the winter we grew a lot of squash especially crown prince f1 again not organic seed um, so derogation necessary for that we um, left we cured the squashes in polytunnels we brought them into a tunnel around about the beginning of october and cured them in there for a few weeks and then put them into our squash store which was at the end of the barn it was an insulated section of the barn insulated specially for squash and you can see them all on the shelves here um we'd pack them in and then put them in the in the veg share roughly fortnightly right the way from kind of christmas through till um usually the last ones went out in the start of June. Um, the record, we did have once keep a squash in good condition till the first week of August. That was in 2019 after the summer of 2018, when I think 
that summer was so ridiculously hot the squashes reached a really advanced stage of maturity and um, were able to uh, sit in the store for that long but generally speaking we'd go through to June um, we'd use up the, some of the other varieties you can see there, Uchikikuri type, um, sort of a, uh, I think it's Fictor, a, a selection of red curry or something like that. And there's a green curry on the shelf as well, which we did a blind tasteful test, uh, blindfold taste test with squashes, including a supermarket bought butternut squash and green curry came out top, which was good to see that the supermarket obsession with butternut squash is um, a bit annoying, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Um, but recognition of alternative squashes is growing all the time. Um, so that's our squash store, and there's a volunteer loading up the shelves. Um, and this was a problem in when we were curing the um, squashes in the tunnel. Uh, it turned out to be squirrels. Um, I actually, I was convinced it was rats, and um, actually put a uh, uh, one of those hunting cameras, a uh, motion sensor triggered, and found out that it was squirrels and they weren't just going in at night any time during the day when there was no one around they'd be in there going for the seeds um it was a huge pain we lost loads of squashes that year it was the only year it had happened though um that was my last year at canal side couldn't handle it after that I had to leave so i can't say i can't talk about solutions for that um that don't involve that well anyway uh, this was a pumpkin harvest at Clairvo uh, back in the day, which was a very happy occasion. Um, squashes were, uh, chilies rather, were another thing that we, uh, the other fruit that we kept all the way through the winter. Um, these lads are bringing in the um, chili harvest and we dried them in um, a, one of our members had an art studio with a underfloor heating. We just put them in there in those trays, in those orange crates looking much as they look in that picture and they dried to a crisp very very well and it was just an extra thing to have all winter long well they keep indefinitely not just through the winter um and um the current growers at canal side tell me they've tried um dehydrate drying them out just in a in a glass house and they found that worked very well as well so you don't have to have a friend with underfloor heating turns out and finally um this fairly unexciting looking picture is actually our great triumph when we finally found a way to store our apples um in a way that was rat proof um we bought this racking and put very fine uh mesh of something like five millimeter gauge or something all the way around the racking and put we had we had an orchard full of winter storage varieties um and uh we would pack the ones that stored the longest into these cardboard boxes and put them on the wrapping racking uh put the um the wrap mesh all around the outside and we could store apples through till may in that way um, in very, very cold weather, we'd chuck duvets over the top, which would um, come off when they weren't needed. Uh, some varieties that kept the best. I remember Winston was the ultimate um, storage apple for us there. Also, uh, Edward VII was a good uh, winter apple. And I think that was everything I had to share about how we stored vegetables. Oh, uh, drying beans. Um, uh, at Canal Side, we used to grow drying beans, but we found they were just too unreliable from an outdoor crop, so we stopped growing them. Um, and then um, I mentioned this to Andy Dibbon from Abbey Home Farm near Sirencester in Gloucestershire, and he said he's had huge success with um, drying beans and they're a really profitable crop from them, but they grow them under cover to guarantee a good harvest and they grow climbing varieties instead of dwarf. And they found from growing them in a glass house, you wouldn't normally think it was valuable enough bed space, but they were getting huge yields and a guaranteed crop as well. So, um, and they they were hu hugely popular. Their um, their um, customers at a farm shop really liked them, and um, uh, appreciated the fact that this was um, homegrown protein food um, that they pay a good price for. So, um, I do believe that's everything I had to share. And there is our view over our wall garden. One more time. Okay, there we go.